What's going on, everybody? Uh, welcome to our podcast, Mass Media Hysteria. Today is May the 29th, 2021. Uh, I, my name is Court. I'm going to be your host for the duration. With me, as always, is Chris. What's shaking, all you crunchy bacons? Right. Uh, again, this is Andres's bye week, so he should be back next week. Uh, we have a bunch of topics we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about uh, Todd Phillips is officially writing Joker 2. Not that it will necessarily be called that. We don't know. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the new Stephen King Apple TV series, Lisey's Story, which is uh, premiering on Apple TV Plus on June 4th. Uh, I'll just sort of give you guys a little bit of backstory with the, with the book and whatever. Then we got a bunch of trailers we're going to talk about, uh, new trailers for The Tomorrow War, uh, Disney's Jungle Cruise, uh, Marvel's Eternals, and of course, Last Night in Soho uh, from Edgar Wright. And then finally, we are going to do a full spoilers review of the new disney film cruella starring emma stone uh if you want to see a spoiler free review that is up on my channel now i'll do the little card thing uh hopefully i'll remember to do that um as always we want to thank you guys for watching uh we encourage you to subscribe to the channel drop a like on the video share comment your thoughts below uh, i do read all the comments i respond to as many of them as i can so don't think your thoughts are going unread but uh even just giving a like really helps to get the show out there and helps the channel grow so we really appreciate that and i also want to let you know that if you don't have time to watch an hour and a half YouTube video. Our podcasts are now up on various uh, podcasting services like Google Podcasts, Spotify. Uh, we're working to get some more. I'm waiting for approval, uh, but definitely check us out there. So without further ado, we are going to get into our first topic, which of course is Joker 2. Now this, the news originally came from a Hollywood Reporter article mm. And it was kind of it was kind of buried deep down. It was something about lawyers, and I don't know. I didn't read it. I just read, I just read what Joe Blow snipped out of it. Yeah. And it basically just says that that uh, Todd Phillips has signed on to co-write the sequel to Joker. So before we discuss that specifically, Chris, let me ask you: What did you think of Joker? Did you like the movie? Did you dislike it? Oh, very much. I I I liked it quite a lot. Um went into it a bit hesitant. I remember being intrigued by the trailers, um, but I was also kind of worried of like just how much it was wearing uh, its Scorsese influences on its sleeve, but I really enjoyed it. I, I, I was into it. I mean, it, the movie gets a lot of hate. I've, I've, it's probably one of the most divisive big budget movie. Well, it's not even super big budget, but bit, most divisive Hollywood films that I've had with my friends to talk about in a while uh, because some people avidly hated it, but I was into it. At the same time, I wasn't loving it like some of the internet was, where it's just like, this is the greatest cinematic masterpiece. I'm like, no, it was, it was well done. And, and Joaquin Phoenix was incredible in it. Um, but yeah, so I, I was thoroughly, in, I thoroughly enjoyed that weird little movie. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of there with you. I mean, I have, I have my issues with it and it, mm. it, it does feel very, um, you know, like you said, the Scorsese influence, particularly Taxi Driver, is, is you know, they're, they're not even trying to hide it. But I did enjoy the film. Um, I got to see it at TIFF, actually, which was really cool. Todd yeah. Phillips came out and did a little preamble, and that was, that was neat. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I liked it. Um, let me ask you this. Do you, do you want a Joker sequel? Um, yeah, not necessarily. I, I think that the movie, it ends in a, in a good point. I think that it's like, not every movie needs a sequel. And I know that, that, you know, this is from a comic book character. So there could be more stories to tell. I don't think it needs it. Um, but I'm also not a hundred percent against the idea. You know what I mean? What do you, what are, what are your thoughts initially on that? I actively do not want a sequel. to okay. Um, okay. If they make it, I'll see it obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I feel like, for one, I mean, before the first film came out, like they were, Joaquin Phoenix and Todd Phillips were on record saying this is a one-shot, standalone uh, kind of thing. And also, I mean, the whole movie was about the arc of Arthur Fleck becoming the Joker. And uh -huh. he's done that. So where do you go now other than more wacky adventures with the Joker? Like, I just, I feel like, I feel... 
that's not fair. I feel like it's <laughs> it's a dangerous game to play in that it'll just be here's another another adventure with the joker like i I, yeah and you know maybe they have a great story in mind and if so Mm -hmm. cool i'm down Mm -hmm. but i feel like i feel like it was intended as a standalone i feel like a sequel could potentially do a disservice to the original um again you still have the original so that's fine but yeah i i I feel like it might i don't know Mm -hmm. i don't know i i'm 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 wary about it but I, i understand yeah, I mean, because it's like, we, there's so many movies where, uh, you know, obviously they've gotten really shitty sequels, and you just kind of wish that it, it remained a solo standalone thing, and you didn't like, you didn't need to make a franchise out of this. It's it's fine. So I totally get that. Um, I agree. I don't I don't think it needs it at all. Like if if the news came out it was like we are definitively not making a sequel, I'd be like, all right, cool. Um, I I don't know why, but there's just something about it where I'm like. I could potentially see where it could go. And I, I mean, not necessarily like I can see the story, but I can like, I think that there, there could be things to do. I mean, especially because Arthur Fleck as the Joker really didn't show up kind of, kind of until towards the end of the film. So kind of seeing more of him already in Joker mode, not necessarily Arthur Fleck mode. That could be interesting. Um, you know, obviously there are there are examples of good movie sequels. So I I'm at, I'm in this weird point where I'm like I'm not writing it off entirely, but I'm I I'm like cautiously optimistic. Like I'm like okay, I'd like to see what the what's the plot going to be. Uh, wait to see a trailer, which is you know it hasn't even started being fully written or anything, so we're not going to see that for forever. But I don't know. It's it doesn't have to suck. I don't know. It well, and it, it also. <clears throat> it should be noted that like just because Todd Phillips is writing a sequel doesn't mean the movie's actually going to happen. I, I suspect true. that Warner brothers is probably really pushing him to make it, but mm-hmm. who knows, maybe he'll get halfway through and be like, I, I just don't have a story here or, yeah. you know, it's, it's all kind of up in the air right now, but also, I mean, are, are you surprised that this is happening? No, not at all. The movie made a billion dollars with a B on a fifty million dollar budget. That is, you know, a, people have talked about it where it's the the rate of return is technically greater than let's say Avengers Endgame. Like Avengers right. Endgame made almost you know three billion dollars, but that movie cost over three hundred million just to make, not including right. like marketing and shit like that. So when you have that big of a money maker, it was it was. Uh, a foregone conclusion like i know i remember at the time when it came out you know i todd phillips and joaquin were kind of like yeah that's probably not is a standalone but as soon as i saw the box office numbers i was like the warner brothers isn't gonna give a shit what you and todd phillips and joaquin phoenix say they're making a sequel um right. so i'm not surprised at all well and it's I, I believe i believe i read it's the only r-rated movie ever to make a billion dollars at least at least like north american film i think yeah, I mean, I I think you're right. Yeah, I think it, I was trying to think if uh, what's it called that Passion of the Christ movie made it, but no, I don't think it did. Um, yeah, you're probably right, which is surprising. I mean, I guess it you know takes such an iconic figure as the Joker, which is it's it's interesting. I think like he's probably the most iconic comic book villain ever. You oh, know what I, I mean? Like so, I yeah. I don't think you can have any Marvel that like you know the Loki series is going to come out, but if that came out as a movie, I don't think that would make a billion dollars. You I know don't what I mean? Think so either no. Yeah, so it's it makes sense that this would be the one to take that. Well, and also too, I mean, it won two Oscars, right? Uh, Joaquin Phoenix won Best Picture, mm-hmm. and uh, I believe this is how it's pronounced. I believe her name is Hilder Gunadotter, uh, mm-hmm. who did the score, that sort of haunting like dual cello yeah, thing. Fantastic score! It was great. It was really great. Really good score. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so Joker two uh, apparently like it's. Google. Exactly. Apparently it's being written. Uh, if you guys want to jump into the comments, let us know. Are you looking forward to it? Do you want them to do it? Did you like Joker? Uh, whatever your thoughts, jump down below. Let us know what you think. Uh, we're going to move on just very briefly. I just want to mention the new Stephen King Apple TV Plus series, Lisey's Story. Now, this is a book. This is Stephen King's favorite book that he has ever written. It's his uh, personal favorite. It's kind of a love letter to his wife, uh, but it's essentially about uh lisi is married to this uh prolific writer surprise surprise a stephen king book about a writer he dies 
then she's kind of well let me let me just read the actual log line here i brought it up um a widow becomes the object of a dangerous stalker obsessed with her husband's work. So basically her husband dies. There's a stalker. He's trying to get like all the sort of manuscripts that hadn't been um, published, something like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. But then there's also, there's a, a, a fantasy element where she finds uh, a book he wrote in secret, I think for her. And she kind of goes on like, almost like a scavenger hunt through this, fantasy land that he created in his head she like kind of gets teleported there it's a weird book i was not a big fan of it but I'm, I'm i'm curious to check this out i believe it's an eight episode i'm not sure if it's a limited series or if it's just an eight episode season that will potentially go on mm -hmm. i hope it's a mini series i don't i don't i don't like the idea of adapting a book into a potentially ongoing tv series i think that's yeah. always a bad idea mm -hmm. but uh just to give you a little bit of the cast here it's a good cast uh, Julianne Moore, Joan Allen, Dane DeHaan, Jennifer Jason Lee, and Clive Owen. So good cast. That's all right. Yeah. Uh, cast. And it's, it's going to start, I, I believe it'll be coming out weekly. Uh, so the first episode is going to be dropping on Apple TV plus on uh, June. Did I say fourth or did I say seventh? It doesn't matter uh, what I said. What did I write down? <laughs> it's June 4th. Is the, June 4th. Yeah. I just pulled it up. Oh, okay. Perfect. It took me a while because I've not heard of this and I was, Typey, I was Googling every way of spelling Lisi. I'm like, well, how the hell is it? Nothing came up. So it was just like Stephen King book, fuck. Uh, so I found it. Uh, um, I've not heard of this at all. Like, I had no idea this was a thing. Sorry, Jennifer. What? No, sorry, Julianne Moore. I apologize. Um, I don't know. But I mean, sounds kind of interesting. It sounds like a cool premise for sure. Well, I just, I just put this together in my head, but. Uh... Julianne Moore and Jennifer Jason Lee. We all we watched uh, both of them just recently in the Woman yeah. in the Window. Yeah, I, I what I don't know. I mentioned it. You seemed like not as surprised. I did not recognize Jennifer Jason Lee in that movie. She had, I mean, she wasn't a big part, but it was like every time I saw her, maybe it was someone with the wig. I was just like, who is that? I don't know. And I'm like, holy shit! I've I've always found Jennifer Jason Lee to be like, I don't want to say a chameleon necessarily, but. Uh -huh. She does look different in every movie. Yeah. Like, I remember in um, Dolores Claiborne, good movie, mm -hmm. speaking of Stephen King, uh, not, not the easiest book to read. That book is crazy because it's one monologue. It's Dolores Claiborne on a monologue for the entire novel. It's not broken up into chapters or anything. Mm -hmm. That was a struggle. Good book, but it was a struggle to read. But in Dolores Claiborne, um, Jennifer Jason Lee looks exactly like an ex-girlfriend of mine, like freakishly so. Oh, she's yeah. never looked like that in any other movie. <laughs> it's, it's weird she looks different in every movie it's very strange yeah yeah um but i mean she was she was fine in the woman in the window i thought julianne moore was really good in like the yeah. kind of one scene the, she had yeah that, so. no julianne moore is is a pro man and she she stole a she stole the show out of that movie that i really do not like yes yes she did so uh we will move on here and we are going to talk some uh some trailers now uh, -huh. uh let's start with uh, jungle cruise shall we let's do it okay so jungle cruise is uh, a new disney movie also based on a ride i believe from disneyland mm -hmm. or disney world or both i've never been both, yeah okay mm -hmm. um it stars Dwayne The Rock Johnson and uh, blank another Emily name, Blunt. Emily Blunt. Thank you. Uh, you also have Jesse Plemons in there. Jesse Plemons is always happy when that guy shows up. Mm -hmm. uh, did you see Game Night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's great in it as he that weird so, creepy neighbor. <laughs> that one that one line he had in Game Night where they say like you know the Doritos were three for five dollars or something or buy mm -hmm. one get two free and he just goes like how would that be profitable for the Frito-Lay Corporation? <laughs> and I died. Uh, he's, <laughs> he's always great. He was also like amazing on Breaking Bad, terrifying on Breaking Bad. Yeah. Um, this movie looks to me fairly ridiculous. One thing I will say that I got from the trailer though, I'm getting really good chemistry between Emily Blunt and Dwayne Johnson. Did you, did mm. you find that? Yeah, I mean, they, they're, they're both extremely charming. Um, I, I think The Rock can, can be charming with anybody. Mm -hmm. And Emily Blunt is, is um, yeah, she could, they're, they're both like immensely likable and they seem to be playing off each other really well. And they seem to be having like fun in, in this wacky role, I, roles, I suppose. Well, and, and one thing, uh, 
for for people watching uh chris didn't get around to watching the trailer until we uh got this podcast going so i watched him watch the trailer uh a trailer reaction video if you will and uh his his first his first thought was why do they have to go supernatural would you yeah, like man. to expound upon that yeah, because I, I mean, I knew this movie was was being made, and I think I remembered that it was going to be supernatural. But the, the last time I saw a trailer was like nearly two years ago, because this was supposed to come out in 2020. Um, I'm, I guess, I'm not in, inherently against the idea of like let's just uh, let's make a, a a movie out of our theme park ride because I actually unabashedly really enjoy the the first Pirates of the Caribbean film. I, I love it. Love it. I think that yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's such it's such fun and. But I think that the more that they've attempted it, the more that it, it is kind of proven to be lightning in a bottle. Like it just it just worked that one time. I'm not a fan of the sequels, not a fan of the Haunted Mansion, not a fan of whatever. When every other attempt that they tried to make it like a Pirates kind of movie, it's like just has not worked. Um, so I was kind of like, okay, I could see how a Jungle Cruise could work. I like the casting, but this just seems so overblown to me and right off the bat where it does like this weird underwater shot of like there's a tree of life under the water and i'm like who gives a shit man i yeah. mean you're on the <laughs> if you the the ride uh because you've never been on it's it's what it is it's a, the jungle cruise you're just going on a boat and you see animatronic hippos you're like oh my god it's a hippo and the the part of the appeal it just like that you have to say it like that okay. uh part of the appeal is uh they have uh uh the this guide and the the they hire these people for these rides that that are like really good at improvisation uh, or they should be and they're always like making jokes and i've done it where i've gone like on the same ride with the same person uh hosting it you know several times you know kind of run back in line and stuff and they say something new every time it's yes. it's it's really funny um so i'm like yeah i could this seemed like a safe bet cuz it had a recognizable name everybody likes the ride it didn't need to be this $250 million explosion of supernatural bullshit. Um, I, <laughs> I'm sounding really negative, but it just seems so overblown to me. And it seems like it's trying way too hard to be pirates to the point of like, uh, like skeleton slash, like, I don't know if they're skeletons, but they're, they're ghostly, like mm. buccaneers <clears throat> that are coming back to life and they're the villains. And I'm like, really? Like that's pirates man you know it's the ghostly ship from from the black pearl that's that's pirates of the caribbean and i get that was a big hit but it's so like unashamedly just a retread of that it's not needed yeah that's that's kind of how i felt i mean i i also uh, i mentioned to you i got a, a pretty strong jumanji vibe out of this as well mm -hmm. like the the new ones with the rock it really looks like a mix of and not just because the rock is in it but a lot of the things that are happening in the trailer look very similar it's kind of shot in a similar way mm -hmm. um yeah it looks like jumanji meets pirates and weirdly i like both of those movies i'm, I'm not terribly psyched for this i'll again i'll see it yeah but yeah you know you because we we're talking about it, you and i are, are we we both said that we liked the the recent jumanji movies um because they're fun and i think that yeah. part of part of the reason why i i like those movies uh especially the first one with the rock um and why this trailer is not really doing it for me is that I think that Jumanji was a bit more tongue in cheek. Like it right. seemed to kind of like lean into the, like, this is absurd. It's a, it's a video game and they're kind of poking fun. It's not, I don't know. And this looks like the jungle cruise looks like it's trying to have fun, but it also looks like it's taking itself pretty seriously of like explosions and there's a Nazi submarine and there's all oh, ghosts and stuff. And it's like, it doesn't seem like they're it's in on the joke the way that right. Jumanji is. Um, yeah, man. I don't know. This just looks like a big budget, just bleh, CGI crap fest to me. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> who knows? Maybe it'll be tons of fun. Maybe it'll be fun yeah. like the Pirates movies or Jumanji. I hope so. Um, mm -hmm. At the very least, if if the chemistry that I'm seeing between Emily Blunt and, and Dwayne Johnson in the trailer, if that mm -hmm. plays out through the whole movie, I, I would imagine I'll have some fun with it. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll see. One thing I'll say, and this could be wrong, uh, cause I was, I literally had the thought before I, before I looked it up, I was like, this looks like it's going to be long. Like the, the way that the sequels to the Pirates of the Caribbean movies were way okay. too long. So this could be wrong because IMDb sometimes is, is off when it's like a few months in advance of a movie being released. But at the moment it says that the jungle cruise is two hours and 38 minutes long. 
if I, if that is how long it actually is, it's going to be a slog. I don't care how charming The Rock and Emily Blunt are. That's too fucking long for yeah, that's, pardon, that's... pardon the French. So hopefully it's wrong because there's been times when you, you've probably seen it before. You go on IMDb and it's like, this is like, you know, an hour and a half and it actually is like longer or whatever. Right. Um, so I'm hoping that's wrong. But if that's the length, then Disney's really not learned its lesson from just you know the diminishing returns of the of the extremely bloated pirates films right uh we should say that uh the movie is coming out on apparently july 30th in theaters and on disney plus with premiere access so it'll probably cost you i don't know say 30 bucks or something like that Yippee. <clears throat> we're going to move on to the new trailer for the upcoming chris pratt sci-fi movie the tomorrow war and we talked about uh, the teaser trailer on the <laughs> podcast uh, couple of weeks uh, ago it was embarrassing because i i was the one that was like we got to talk about it and then i didn't realize that it was just a 30 second nothing commercial it didn't show anything it was like yep that's a movie with chris pratt so now we got a, an actual trailer yeah so uh, my understanding is the basic premise is 30 years in the future uh there's a, aliens are destroying humanity they're going to wipe humanity out so people in the future time tra travel back to i guess current times presumably to basically draft soldiers to come fight in the future and chris pratt gets drafted uh what were your overall thoughts on this trailer chris um kind of meh to be honest it's it looks like it doesn't look like the most original thing it just i was just kind of getting like an independence day vibe um i there were elements of it that I, that I was kind of intrigued by. I, I appreciated that it seemed to have more humor than I expected it to. I I thought this was going to like take itself dead serious, but right. there's a bit there's a bit of levity to it. Nothing that really made me laugh, but it was just kind of like okay. I appreciate that with this ridiculous premise, um, they seem to be having a little bit of fun to it. Um, but yeah, it doesn't it doesn't look bad. It just kind of looks meh to me. It it looks like it has very generic direction. Um, the action's not super exciting to me. I like Chris Pratt. I know people have kind of turned on him, but I, I still find him to be charming. Um, but yeah, I, it's, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't have much high hopes for this. Um, there were little things that I, that I liked throughout it. One thing, I will give it this though. The trailer did give me an oh shit moment, which, which I was surprised. I think it might've, you might know what I'm talking about, but it seems as though when they, when they travel to the future, it's like they just kind of drop them it's like, the, it seems like the, the characters are just falling from the sky and you're kind of following them down. It looks like people are just hitting pavement and like, like people are falling into pools. It, and that gave me an oh shit moment where I'm like, oh, I like that. Where it's like traveling, time traveling is extremely dangerous. And there's like a one in 10 chance you're just going to hit pavement. Right. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of meh. What are your thoughts? I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. I, I yeah. thought it looked just very generic. I think is, I think that's the perfect word for it. Yeah. Uh, it's just uh, pew 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 aliens and yeah. i don't know i it, we get a little bit more of that same shot from the end of the teaser where they're sort of looking up the stairwell and you hear the alien coming and we got like maybe a tiny bit more of a look <clears throat> of a look at it but i don't know i'm not that interesting i did i did like the whole time travel thing that's i'm always when it comes to movies or stories in general that mm. involve time travel i'm always curious as to how it gets like implemented because it's such an out there kind of technology technological idea that you can sort of do anything you want with it mm -hmm. um so that, that was a cool interpretation of how time travel will work there's a stephen king story i always bring it back to stephen king um there's a stephen king story called the jaunt it's like a short story and it's about uh no it's about teleportation not time travel Never mind. I'm get it together, court. Ugh. Just, I'm just not prepared today. I'm, I'm sorry, guys. You have to see mommy and daddy fight on, uh -huh. on camera. Um, um, sorry, right. go ahead. I was just going to say, this is a small thing, um, but I was actually a little sad. I mean, we haven't seen the movie, but it was a little sad to see um, an actress that I quite like, uh, Betty Gilpin, essentially seemingly just being the, the wife. wife. Yeah. That kind of bugged me because I, I quite like her. She's great in Glow. Um, the Hunt, which is a movie that I didn't think was that great, but she was awesome in she it. She was um, awesome in it, yeah. She, she has great range. And I was just really sad that she just seemed like the wife that was like, come back safe, Chris right. Pratt. I love you. I'm like, she is wasted in this role. Um, 
I don't know. Did that did that cross your mind? Because I think yeah. we've talked about we, you like Getty, Betty Gilpin as well. I think I've only seen her in The Hunt. I can't oh, really? think of okay. anything else I've seen her in. I haven't seen yeah. well. I've heard it's awesome. It's, it's a great show. Um, but yeah, it, it, I did sort of get that impression of just like, uh, now granted the trailer was very heavily Chris Pratt focused. So yeah. maybe she comes in clutch in the third quarter or fourth quarter, oh, excuse me, but yeah. um we will see, but yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not super psyched for this thing. Again, I'll watch yeah. it. Um, it is mm -hmm. dropping on Prime Video, I believe, on July second. So it's really going for that Independence Day vibe. I Absolutely. swear. Yeah, Absolutely. especially when when I saw July second, I was like, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't make that connection, but yeah, totally. Uh -huh. Um, and now, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, hopefully, Bill Pullman shows up at some point. Yes, we can only hope. I was gonna say now we can talk about trailers that are actually good. Right. Right. So let's uh, let's start with uh, Marvel's Eternals. So and we've we've talked quite a bit about this film uh, on the podcast in the past, um, because, of course, this is the latest. Well, I guess we're getting Black Widow first, um, mm -hmm. but it's the next Marvel phase Four film. And I think everyone's been kind of curious as to what phase four is going to look like. And of course, the, the sort of big selling point about this movie is it's directed by Chloe Zhao, who of course just won Best Director and Best Picture for her movie Nomadland. I remember seeing Nomadland at TIFF back in September and thinking, this person is doing a Marvel movie? Like, mm -hmm. they couldn't be more different. Although, seeing this trailer, I can actually... There were some visual moments where I thought to myself, like, I kind of see the connection here. Um, I also don't know anything about the property Eternals. Um, but before we get to that, uh, what are your sort of thoughts on the movie itself? And, and what did you think of the trailer? Um, I am very, very excited for this. And I thought the trailer was great. Um, I just rewatched it before we uh, got on here. And I actually really liked it more. Like I saw it earlier this week because it came out on Monday. And I was like, oh, that looks great. But rewatching it, I was like, I think this is going to be something pretty special. Um, I've enjoyed, I really enjoyed the Marvel movies. I'm, I consider myself a, a fan of the MCU. I get excited for them. You know, they're popcorn fun. But watching this within the first few frames, I, I, the, the first thought that came to my mind is that this is easily the best looking Marvel film. It looks uh, this, absolutely gorgeous. The cinematography is unlike anything they've done. And I, like I said, I like the Marvel movies, but a lot of times their, their cinematography is a bit... Uh, not generic, but it's just safe. It's just like, this is a, an efficient way we get coverage. Everybody's kind of evenly lit, but this is, has some gorgeous natural light and, and it looks like Chloe Zhao's other films. Like we've Nomadland, but also um, there's a movie that she did called The Writer, which is a lot of handheld, a lot of natural light where it feels like organic and it's it looks beautiful. That's the main takeaway is that this looks stunningly gorgeous. Yeah. And um Chloe Zhao is the selling point where it really it looks like her films. Like I said, you said you saw Nomadland. I'm sure that you could see kind of like the visual connections. Mm -hmm. Didn't it didn't like right off the bat just feel like, yeah, that looks like Chloe Zhao. Totally. Which is not which is not something you can say about a lot of Marvel films. Um right. it's it seems like very few of the directors really kind of get to leave their stamp, like Taika Watiti um and James Gunn. Uh, but the others, it just kind of feels like, yeah, I mean, it, it, they, you know, uh, what's his name? The, who's the guy that's doing uh, the, the latest Spider-Man films? Uh, Tom Watts? That sounds Tom, right. Yeah, so I apologize. <clears throat> yeah, I can't even remember his John, name. No. John Watts? John Watts, I think. <clears throat> right. um, where it just, it feels fine. It's good. It's not bad direction, but it's just kind of like, yeah, it gets the job done. But this looks like something special. And and I'm I'm really looking forward to this actually. Yeah, there there are a couple of moments in this trailer, and right at the beginning where you see like all these people sort of standing on that cliff, and then that ship is coming in, that cool like mm. right angle sort of that was gorgeous. Mm. Um, there's the shot of the one guy; he's got like a spear or something, and he's doing some magic. And then that I don't know that looked gorgeous. My favorite yeah. shot in the trailer though is. Um, the, the bird's eye view shot looking down at all the people dancing in the in the oh, really man. colorful costumes. Yeah. And then we get the shot of Kumail Nanjiani. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful shot. Yeah. Um, I love that this is reuniting Jon Snow and Rob Stark. That's Hell yeah. Great. That's as a Game of Thrones fan, that really kind of I'm like, yes. Yeah. I they better have scenes together. I, I swear to God, really Chloe hope Zhao. So. 
Oh man. Um, yeah, and no, you're, like yeah. she's she's got to be a fan of the show if she put them both in there. So I would yeah, imagine she'd let them get together. Like, game of what? Game of <laughs> who? Um, yeah, no, that, that's that's I love that. Great cast, man. I mean, Richard Madden, Kit Harrington, Salma Hayek, Angelina Jolie. Um, let me look at some of the other ones. Um, Kumail, uh, Kumail Nanjiani, Nanjiani, of course, who's you know went through the uh, now famous uh, body transformation. The dude's cut from stone. Um, Did you see he was on? Um, I think it was Kimmel, and it was it was this was probably like I don't know shortly before the pandemic, mm-hmm. um, and he was he was talking about <clears throat> his his workout regimen and how he's done shooting the film, but he just he's still kind of working out and he's hasn't gotten back to eating and whatever. But he's like, I miss pizza, I miss cake, and because uh, I haven't had it, I still I've been meaning to, I just kind of haven't, and yeah. then like. Jimmy brings out a pizza and he actually starts crying a little bit and starts oh, eating pizza. And then they lower from the rafters this like <laughs> crown of like cakes. He's like surrounded by a carousel of cakes. Yeah. It's hilarious. Look at that. That's that's <clears throat> that sounds awesome. Dude, those body transformations are rough. It's um insane. you know what's his name? Uh the guy who plays not Charlie, but he plays he's in uh Always Sunny. Do you watch Always Sunny? Yep. Okay, Love so it. the guy the guy who plays Mac. Mac, what's yeah. Uh, Rob McElhaney. Yes. Um. So he made a post a bit ago because like there was a season where his character got ridiculously cut, and he made this long post about like guys, it's super easy. All you have to do is not eat anything that you like ever. You can't drink. You have to work out fifteen times a day. You have to eat this amount of protein. Um. And that you have to do that. Blah blah blah. And you have to have a studio pay for it all. It's right. easy. I and think I, I did see that. That sounds familiar. And I appreciated that because I, you know, people talk for, for ages, this is a weird tangent, but people have talked for ages about the unrealistic kind of uh, beauty and body standards for women. But it, it's also like, I think people are becoming more aware of kind of these unrealistic body standards for men. Um, I still think that women in media get it far worse of yeah. just like, you have to look like this. But this idea of like, you have to be cut from stone to be attractive as a guy. If you take a shirt off and you're not like, Kamal Nanjiani anymore then don't even bother and it, it makes it which is unfair because it's it's pretty unrealistic that people will, will remain that cut you know what I mean it's like people get shredded for a bit but you can't maintain it because at some point you're like I gotta eat some I'm not gonna work out um is that a weird tan does that resonate with you at all no I get it I mean <laughs> uh, like there is no way in hell I will ever look like that. Sorry, ladies. I'm just not doing ladies. it. Ladies. I, I don't want to be miserable all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like to eat <laughs> food. some of the time. I, I don't want my muscles to be sore at all times. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So fuck yeah. that. I like I like uh, working out. I don't like running. Running sucks, but I, I like working out. But I love food too, man. It's mm-hmm. like, oh my God, just, I want to, can I just lift weights and eat pasta and just be fine? Right. Like I'll be muscular, but just, I want a tummy. Um, Random tangent. I'm sorry. Eternals oh, yeah. looks good. <laughs> it looks great. Uh, Yeah. What's the, uh, I believe it's November. November, November. November 5th is what it said on IMDb. It is it really? Actually, that's what it said. And that's what oh it says God. on IMDb. I was just making a joke, but I was about V for Vendetta, November, November, what is it? Like, remember, remember the 5th of November? Right. You know, I've never seen that movie. I know the phrase, but I've never actually it's, seen that movie. It's pretty, pretty, pretty good. It looks cool. It looks cool. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah. Oh, just a couple other people who are in uh, the film. We also have uh, Gemma Chan, uh, uh-huh. Brian, Brian Tyree Henry, who's like, every time I see that guy, I'm like, I really like this guy. Except for a woman oh, for in sure. the window, but it wasn't given much. It wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault. He also originated the role of. Um, I found this out recently. He originated the role of, and this is the, actually the character's name, General Butt Fucking Naked, on. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Book of Mormon. Oh, oh my God! If you guys, I don't know if you guys are musical in the musicals, but the Book of Mormon is is terrific. It's amazing. It's I I I think that some of the uh, some of the depictions of like the african tribe of like not aged well but i think that it's matt stone and trey parker were going for i don't know it's like satires is hard to do so i could i, I remember talking to some people because my wife's really big into musical theater and they're like i don't know if book of mormons aged well and i'm like i could see that but it's also 
they're satirizing everything. So there's yeah. an absurdity to everything. Anyway, but that's incredible. I had no idea that he, he originated the role. Yep. And, um, you know, I mean, <clears throat> also like as far as it not aging well and being satire, it's also like kind of we're seeing the story through the prism of these two like yeah. really, really naive mm -hmm. Mormon kids, right? But yeah, it's it's a great show. The songs are amazing. Uh, it's the weird thing about that show. Again, we're going off on a tangent, but whatever. <laughs> I'll talk about Book of Mormon anytime. I've seen it twice. It's mm. weirdly like it is so wrong, like so incredibly wrong. But at the same time, it's not like I went into it assuming it was going to be like mocking Mormonism. It's not. It's poking a little fun at them. But yeah. at the end of the day, these two guys are just trying to help people. It's a weirdly very sweet, like heartwarming show. Yeah, Matt Stone and Trey Parker are are bigger softies than I think they let, let on. I don't mean right. that as an insult. I mean like they they definitely have like a heart, and they'll like they'll tear you to shreds and make fun of you. But at the end of the day, they're also like they're not gonna completely shit on you. And they'll I don't know. It's you're right. There's a there's a bit of a sweetness to to this. Um, to the characters despite how kind of dumb and ignorant they come across throughout yeah. most of it uh, okay so let's uh let's move on to the final trailer this is the one i've been really looking forward to talking oh, to yeah. about because yeah. i'd been meaning to watch it i hadn't gotten around to it until literally half an hour before we we jumped on here mm. uh, but this is the new edgar wright film looks like a drama horror i'm not even sure what to make of this thing uh -huh. uh, it's called last night in soho it stars Anya Taylor-Joy, who I am unabashedly a fan of. I've been singing her praises ever since The Witch or The Vivitch, if you will. She is wonderful. I have not watched uh, Queen's Gambit yet. I hear it's terrific. Bruh. Um, Dude, the Queen's Gambit rocks and she's yeah. incredible in it. Well, and she uh, she just, uh, last weekend, she hosted Saturday Night Live. Crushed it. She wow, was great. Right on. And yep. that's, I've said it on the show before, like so, that's a bar for me. If someone can go on there and mm -hmm. either like at least play along and have some fun with themselves uh, or even be good. That goes a long way for me. And she was, yeah. she was fantastic. If you're on SNL and you don't make court laugh, get out of his face. Don't mm -hmm. even talk to him. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Asshole. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so we have Anya Taylor joy and we also have Thomas and McKenzie who I've only seen in one film. It was Taika Waititi's Jojo rabbit, which I'm such a fan of that movie. Uh -huh. It's even my phone screen. Oh, oh. yeah. Ooh. Ever since I saw that movie, it's that's that's been the thing. Uh -huh. Jojo Rabbit was my favorite movie of 2019. I also saw that at TIFF. That was the last movie I saw that that year at uh -huh. TIFF. It won the the People's Choice Award at, at TIFF, and mm. fuck, that's such a great movie. So, and it Thomas and McKenzie's movie. really really good in it. Mm -hmm. um, you've seen it, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, I love I love Jojo Rabbit. Yeah, yeah. it's terrific. Um, so this this movie last night in Soho. I honestly, like, I, I don't even know where to start. So I'm going to be a jerk and make you do it. Excuse me. Um, dude, I'm, I'm beyond excited. I, I adore Edgar Wright. Um, I, I, I feel like I was like one of the, it sounds stupid because I was like a kid, but I was like, I really felt like I was one of the, 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 I was a part of the initial wave that was singing the praises of Shaun of the Dead, where I was like telling people like, this is British comedy about zombies. Trust me, it's great. Uh, but I've loved everything he's done. Ironically, it's weird that like his most, probably most famous one or internationally famous one, Baby Driver, is the movie I like the least. I still like it, but some people were just like, oh my God, Baby Driver. And I'm like, yeah, but what about Shaun of the Dead? Or what about Scott Pilgrim versus the World, which I adore. That's that's one of my favorite films. Shot um, in Toronto. Exactly. No, it's <laughs> it actually set in Toronto, which is yep. a rarity. Usually they shoot there, but it that's a Canadian film through and through. Um, so I was already really looking forward to this. This was actually one of my my this one. I was really upset when when it got moved because it was supposed to come out in 2020. A lot of other movies that got moved, I was like, I can wait. But this, I was like, just, bro, just give it to me. And I I love I love this trailer. Uh, it's uh, this perfect kind of moody atmosphere of, of her of Anya Taylor Joy singing downtown, uh, kind of like few you know in a in a. I'm not a musical person, but it's a in a minor key, so it's like very kind of sad. Um, and this looks like a straight up horror film uh, that's that's completely inspired by um, the Italian Gallo 
films, uh, Giallo, G- Giallo, I don't know how you pronounce it properly, but uh, think Dario Argento, think uh, Mario Bava. It's essentially just, just psychedel- psychedelic colors from the 60s and 70s, a lot of different, like just stylish, um, you know, ex- extreme exaggerated shots. And this looks visually stunning. Like, I, like I said, I rewatched it and, it, and it, I was taken back because there's so many quick cuts that it's not just that like, oh, it looks like there's a lot of pretty colors, but he does a lot of amazing stuff with with uh, with mirrors and reflections. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess we should kind of talk about the brief plot that we can kind of get from it, because this is a teaser, so it doesn't explain a lot, but... It seems as though uh, Thomas and Mackenzie plays a, a, a woman uh, who, who arrives in um, London, modern day London. And she seems to be like a fashion designer of some sort and um, seems to be having a rough go of it. it she seems a bit down, but s- somehow at night, it seems like she's transported back to 1960s London, the swing in 60s. And when she looks in the reflection, she doesn't see herself, but she sees another woman played by Anya Taylor-Joy, like this this gorgeous kind of fashionista dancer. Um, and jazz, so it seemed, jazz singer or something. Too, yeah, I yeah. So I, I know it reminds me of something. I can't quite think of it, but it's sort of like she, it, it seems like Thomas and McKenzie's character becomes obsessed with being this, this alter ego, this avatar, uh, where she starts dyeing her hair blonde and stuff like that and becoming more fashionable. But there seems to be a dark underbelly to it as well. Like the spirits from the past are kind of coming back. So it looks wild. I've been talking a lot. I want to hear your thoughts. Well, yeah, I mean, it's <clears throat> and it, it, like the, the trailer really sort of, it, it's, it's, what am I trying to articulate here? The whole like first half of the trailer, I was like, okay, so yeah, it's like okay, this this looks cool, and then it takes like a tonal shift into like like you even hear the 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 voiceover of like, do you believe in ghosts? And then bang, it like turns into yeah. this like kind of nightmarish, but like beautifully nightmarish. Mm-hmm. Um, it, yeah, it's it's very colorful, like a lot of kind of almost like neon colors, and like you were mm-hmm. saying, he's playing a lot with reflections, and I I can't wait to see this thing. I'm yeah. just like I'm praying to the to the pandemic gods that the theaters will be open by because this comes out i think late october October. oh perfect timing this looks like a perfect halloween flick for me i'm i'm so stoked and hopefully by then i'll have my second dose so i can actually go back because this also like thank you i appreciate that um edgar wright's movies really do play well on the big screen but this looks like to me this looks like one of his most cinematic of anything that he's done at least of the ones that i've seen um oh for sure and he's always been a cinematic filmmaker which sounds you know you know i mean his direction has always pushed the visuals like he doesn't do anything half-assed nothing feels like oh we just got some basic coverage or anything right so that's saying a lot that you that you think this is like his most cinematic movie just it just looks so Mm -hmm. darkly beautiful to me and I, i I need to see this on the big screen. I, oh, absolutely. This is like, this is one of those movies where if it was, they weren't thinking of doing it, but hypothetically, it's like, oh, you could watch it day and date on TV. I'd be like, screw that. I'm waiting to see this in theaters. Yep. Um, Well, before we move on, I just wanted to do a quick mention of a couple other cast members. Uh, Matt Smith. He's in, well, he, um, most famous for Doctor Who. He played Doctor Who for a few seasons. I'm a big fan of that show. He's terrific. I want to see him do more stuff. Like I, I thought he would blow up more than he did. He seems to still be doing kind of like smaller roles. He's also in uh, the first two seasons of Netflix, The Crown, which I guess is way more popular than I thought. Um, so people have seen him. He looks kind of, he, I like him because he, he's this, he could be charming, but he could also be a son of a bitch. Okay. Um, and he looks like kind of, he, I don't know. He, he, I get this vibe that he, this character is, is, he, he seems like he's up to something. Also, there was a quick glimpse of Terrence Stamp. Actually, it, he, b- before we talk about that, oh, I just yeah. want to mention quickly, uh, Matt Smith is also, I think he's leading the new uh, Game of Thrones spinoff, House of the Dragon. Yes. I think it's called. Right. I think he's yeah. uh, doing Good that. Good for him. And I, I, I see see more stuff. Yeah. I saw him uh, in a picture with the with the like platinum blonde wig, and I was like, yeah, you look like a Targaryen. Oh, I can sure. see it. Yeah. Um, Terrence Stamp, yeah, awesome. Dude, That's he's a legend. Always a plus. Um, have you seen uh, the Soderbergh movie, The Limey? I think so. 
Okay, I, I only I mentioned so. it because that, that's like a, Terrence Stamp is just unhinged in that. And I, that's my go-to like Terrence Stamp role where I'm like, he absolutely crushes it. He okay. was also in, um, uh, I believe, oh, I got to double check. He's also in in one of my favorite films, which is, I, I, I might be a surprise, but uh, the movie, The Adventures of Pris- Priscilla, the Queen of the Desert, I've which is seen that. Uh, him and um, Hugo Weaving, and uh, Guy Pierce are drag queens in the Australian desert. Okay, amazing! It's 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 so much fun. Um, so random recommendation: if you want to see Terrence Stamp in drag, highly recommend The Adventures of Priscilla, the Queen of the Desert. I don't love Guy Pierce. I, I'm I'm in the what minority there. You? Why? What did he do? I just I just don't find I never find him convincing. Oh, no. Even even like Memento, I love the movie. I don't particularly like him in that movie. What did he do to you, man? Did he part, hurt you? Part of it was his makeup in Prometheus. <laughs> and I think that's fair. <laughs> he did he did it himself. He's like, no, I got this guy's fuck off. Um also also in uh in this film that we're talking about the uh last night. So we also have Diana Rigg, and I think it yes. might be her final film. Yeah. Um a British legend Diana Rigg, who I think a lot of modern audiences would know as uh, Elena Tyrell from mm-hmm. Game of Thrones, but she, you know, she's been in Bond films. She was in the the show The Avengers, which was before it was a Marvel thing, was a uh, was a British kind of spy show. She's an absolute like screen legend. And I think you're right. This might be her last role, which is terribly sad. But you know, if this movie is as amazing as we're hoping, you know, that's what a way to go out for right? sure. Yeah. Right, so do you have any any uh, other things you want to mention about this trailer before we move on? No, looks great. Um, oh, oh, the other thing is, I know I've recommended a shit ton of movies. We mentioned it last week, but you got you to gotta check out Suspiria, the original uh, 70s Suspiria. I know you'll dig it, man. Okay. How, how, <laughs> how, how was the remake? Was the remake worth watching too? Or? I, a lot of people didn't like it. I like the remake. It's vastly different movie, um, yeah. but I li- but I think that's why I liked it. If, you, if you're going to remake something, make it your own. It, it wasn't a retread, uh, but you can't, it, you can't touch the original. So. Okay. Mm. All right, cool. So we're going to move on now uh, to our final topic where we are going to do a full spoilers review of the new Disney film Cruella. This, of course, is another one of those movies where they sort of take a villain that we all know, give them kind of a sympathetic backstory, turn them into kind of anti-heroes. I kind of went into this movie a little dubious because I had liked the trailers, but I, I, I didn't think I wanted to see Cruella de Vil as a sympathetic character. Before we get into what we thought, where was your head at going into this one, Chris? Um, I was I was similar similar place where one I you know the I think that the the trope of like here's a villain but from their perspective you know like that was interesting when when like wicked came out you know nearly 20 years ago right um but it's been kind of done and they did that with maleficent <laughs> twice and i didn't care um but something about this got me interested I, again i also want to say that i have not cared for disney's live action remakes like some people like them i they've been like meh to really bad to me like i i hated mulan um so I, I, by all intents and purposes, I shouldn't have been interested in this, but something about the trailers and something about the promotion intrigued me. Um, and I was like, if it can capture this feel, I'm, I'd be into it. And I, I think they did. I think that like it, it really delivered what the trailers promised right. in, in the best way. So you would you would say that you did enjoy the movie? Oh, I re- I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, sorry, I was <laughs> I I thought you asked like just my mindset going into it. No, I, I, I did. Yeah, yeah. No, I I, I thought this. I I kind of loved it. I it's it's flawed, but I was so entertained. Uh, we'll dive into it. But four coats made out of puppies out of five. Okay. Yeah, you know what? I I I really like this movie too. I, I thought mm-hmm. it was just so much fun. Um, visually it was great and I'm sure we'll, we'll get to that but mm-hmm. <clears throat> excuse me like <clears throat> again I, I didn't really want to see Cruella DeVille be sympathetic because like she literally wanted to murder puppies to make a coat murder puppies that's like about as evil as you get I think. <laughs> that's, yeah her name is Cruella DeVille spelled <laughs> devil and she wants to kill puppies yeah 
but um and and even like the first act where we sort of we see her as as a younger girl with her mom the mom sort of recognizes that her name is Estella the mom recognizes that she's got a bit of a mean streak in her and sort of nicknames that sort of uh personality trait Cruella Mm -hmm. she goes off to school she gets expelled she wants to be a a fashion designer and I'm kind of sitting there I'm kind of sitting there going like I don't know Mm -hmm. like not that this is poorly made or anything I just don't Mm -hmm. know that I care but then of course at the sort of end of the first act we see her mother get killed Mm -hmm. she watches her mother die she blames herself and then we sort of jump forward and we cut to emma stone and i don't know i don't know if anyone else could have played the role the way that she did i don't know as much as i enjoyed the movie so much of it was because of her i don't know if i would have enjoyed this movie as much with anybody else she crushed this role Mm -hmm. she was like phenomenal she was like she was so in just she had so much like poise and and you could see like the mannerisms from the animated Cruella de Vil like she got all that the voice you could tell she was having a great time she's kind Mm -hmm. of chewing the scenery what did you think of Emma Stone's performance oh she's fantastic I love Emma Stone uh I in in most of her roles uh, and yeah, like I think having fun is is the main thing that I took away. Is like she's just having a ball with this, uh, and she really is kind of playing up the split personality of like Estella and Cruella. Like they really are like two different people, and you know she does has different voice affectations uh, when she becomes Cruella. So I was really digging her as Estella, but once Cruella comes out of the cage, oh yeah, oh my God, she just crushes it, and it's it's yeah, like I said, everything from the, her poise to her cadence, just the just the way she carries herself she is just it's it's this not sleazy but it's just like it's this like seductress kind of uh villainous just ruthless character and i i loved it i thought she was terrific there was there was times when um i think the british accent as cruella was a bit broad but i think it worked because you know she's this over the top character but Mm -hmm. oh my god yeah it's yeah, I think you're right. Like it's it's hard to imagine anybody else in this role um, because she just was so good. And you couldn't take your your eyes off her. Yeah, and I mean, I think I, when you when you say sleazy, like I kind of know what you mean. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not the right word because that sounds a little bit too negative. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I thought the whole movie had this kind of flair. I said in the in the other review I did, like the whole movie had this kind of '70s punk rock aesthetic. And you really see it in the closing t- the closing titles. Oh, for sure. But like, even when she, and, and it was one of the highlights when the Baroness played by uh, Emma Thompson, who's also great in the film. Fantastic. Um, she's about to have her big, uh, her big fashion show. And then we find out that they filled the thing with moths and they've eaten all the thing. All the mm-hmm. people go outside. And then Cruella has this like punk rock, like outdoor set up oh, thing dude. that was awesome hell yeah it was yeah i was jamming along too but like yeah i got i got this weird like from cruella de in this i got kind of a weird like debbie harry from blondie like like mm-hmm. 70s punk rocker chick kind of thing you know yeah mm-hmm. and i thought the whole movie had that kind of feel to it which sure. i loved and yeah. i thought you know the the soundtrack really reflected that not so much necessarily 70s punk although there was there was blondie and there was the clash yeah. but but uh-huh. a lot of 70s rock you had you know the stones and you had the doors and at first i found the soundtrack a little bit distracting and then i kind of settled into it and, and then i really liked it mm. that really worked for me but mm. um yeah another another thing that really stood out to me and I, before i say that i will say i thought all of the performances in this movie were good i, I there wasn't a performance that stood out to me as as bad no. uh i i did really like joel fry and uh, paul walter hauser as jasper and horace respectively i believe uh-huh. yeah. they were kind of the comic relief i didn't find the movie all that funny but i got a couple of laughs out of them mm-hmm. um i always liked seeing mark strong um yeah mark strong's mark strong yeah <laughs> um he doesn't get a whole lot to do in this movie no. but i i did like that he kind of came over to their camp in the end and was helping them out that that was a nice yeah. 
that was a nice mm-hmm. touch for me. And Emma Thompson is just like, you can tell she's also having a really good time. Like chewing the scenery as, as the most narcissistic person, but it's, it's fun. Like it, it takes a, it takes a, a talented actress of that caliber to, to play it so broad, but also to make it believable and, and enjoyable. Cause I think right. like in the hands of a lesser actor, it would just be like, Oh my God, you're just swinging for the fences. But Emma Thompson just keeps it reined in enough that it's like, you're so unbelievably selfish, but it, it works. Well, yeah, I think, I think because you have, you know, these two characters and of course, eventually it's revealed that, uh, Cruella de, or Estella is actually the daughter of the Baroness. Bum, bum, bum. So they're, they're sort of two sides of the same coin. But because you have because you have Emma Stone sort of playing this character up and playing it for, for the cheap seats, you know, I like that even though there's sort of two sides of the same coin, Emma Thompson is playing it all very deadpan. Like she never, mm. she never goes big. Um, yeah. she's, she's like really emoting but it's all quiet and still and so it's a good like juxtaposition between the two i i I thought and they play the off each other really well especially when it's cruella talking with the baroness oh Oh, there's a scene scene where kind of the centerpiece of the film where uh cruella really kind of makes her debut and and uh unveils herself at this black what's supposed to be a black and white attire uh party and she you know rocks up in this uh gorgeous red dress we'll talk about the costumes i'm sure in a bit uh at more uh at more length but there's a scene of them talking to each other and i really love the the dynamic because um even before the reveal that it's like the baroness is her mother you there's this like subtle thing that emma thompson does of of just kind of like hating cruella but also liking her and also like respecting her <coughs> like there there's certain ways that uh, Cruella would say would just kind of like you know would be blunt in in curt and in just kind of like give these flippant responses and Emma Thompson would give like a flicker of a smile where she's just like you could see that she sees herself in Cruella where it's right. like yeah you got to be this ruthless cutthroat person and you got to be bold and I really like that I really like their chemistry together yeah I would agree and that scene actually had one of my favorite shots in the movie, which was in the trailer. And it was the shot in the trailer that made me go like, okay, I'll watch this movie. But it's when, again, Cruella is essentially making her debut and she comes in and she's, she looks like white riding hood. Like she's got yeah. just like a white shawl and, and hood. Mm-hmm. And then she like sets fire to it and the fire burns it away and reveals this gorgeous red dress. Uh-huh. That shot was amazing. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it, you know, reveals her 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 wild, crazy hair because yeah. before that, she we saw it as a kid, but uh, she was you know kind of dying it red, and then it was just like these this ball of curls. Yeah, great reveal. Yeah. Uh, that's like I'm sure like every actor's dream. Like I want to reveal. I want to. I want <laughs> an entrance like that. And and you know we were saying it last night when we were talking. Like Emma Stone is absolutely stunning in this movie. Like yeah, she's always gorgeous, but mm-hmm. like. And I'm sure a lot of it is is the makeup and the costumes and mm-hmm. the way she plays the character as a kind of a bit of a seductress, whatever. But mm-hmm. she looks absolutely like it's just it's bonkers to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. I think we could touch on it now, but like the the production design, the art design, and the costume, everything is is top notch. The yeah. I mean, the costuming is I think the thing that will stand out the most. It's it's obviously about fashion designs. Um, so, but it, it reminded me a bit of Phantom Thread in the sense of like, uh, more so than, um, how do I say this? So this movie plot wise is very, the Devil's Wear, Devil Wears Prada, very much the Devil Wears Prada. Where, where and Joker. Prada. And Joker, yeah. You meant, you you said the Joker wears Prada in your review and I think that's I the perfect, the perfect analogy for it. <laughs> um, so plot wise, it's very Devil Wears Prada, but aesthetically it's very Phantom Thread where it's, you see these gorgeous gowns and these gorgeous, like it, there's so much creativity behind it um, that I think even people who know, don't ordinarily notice costume design will, will stop and be like, holy crap. Like it's not just that like, oh, it's bright, brightly colored. It's like, it's so stylish and slick and yeah. it, it invokes so much about the characters. Um, every outfit that, that Cruella wore, it was just incredible. And, you know, the makeup that she had where she had kind of this gaunt, almost she reminded me of harley quinn at moments because oh, of just totally. like 
how white her face was and you had the black lipstick i loved it um well there was that <clears throat> sorry just to interrupt there was that one moment uh, there's sort of that kind of like montage towards the end of the second act where it's just cruella fucking with the baroness just like mm-hmm. ruining everything she does but there was that one moment where <clears throat> she shows up um and her she's got like a word painted on her face i don't know the the future the future that was it that yeah. was awesome Hell the moment yeah. where the moment where she came out of the garbage truck with that huge long train of dress and drove away so good so it um, reminded me of uh, zoolander uh, when she came out of the, the garbage truck my <laughs> my wife was like is this derelict right remember zoolander okay all right i don't know if anybody remembers that but there was a whole garbage <laughs> fashion show in that movie it was so good uh i just want to mention uh from imdb all i've got is jenny beaven and tom davies were costume and eyewear and I'm going to say right now, I will not be shocked if they get nominated for Oscars for this yeah. because I absolutely thought all of the costumes were stunning in this film. Yeah, not all, of, not all of them. I would guess like uh, Jasper and Horace, you know, there's nothing. But, but it was still good costume design because I, because yes. in the sense that, you know, you had the stunning, like eye-catching um, dresses and gowns, but at the same time, the costumes that uh, the the other characters what was it Jasper and uh, Horace. The, the, Horace, they it, it invokes what those characters are. Absolutely, that, that's what good costume design is. Where it it they have their unique look, but it also is is a visual shorthand of who these characters are. Yeah. So yeah, I, I mean it's fantastic, but also the production design in general, like the sets were terrific. Like the oh, whole yeah. uh the 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 Baroness is sort of um one her mansion, but also her uh warehouse or wherever you know where they make the clothes in her office uh the cinematography was really gorgeous um a lot of handheld work yeah that's so that's the the first thing that jumped out to me and i think i I messaged you pretty early on uh, when watching this where i said like this feels like a real movie and and what i mean by that is 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 so many of the the disney live action remakes like mulan and aladdin they feel like commercials made by committee for a corporation. Right. Um, especially like Aladdin, you know, directed by Guy Ritchie. And you, I, I could have watched that movie and you, I never would have guessed it was Guy Ritchie. And no. we've seen Guy Ritchie, he has a very unique style. And we've mm-hmm. seen him with a big budget, like the King Arthur movie, which isn't great, but it's like, oh, that's a Guy Ritchie film. And it, his Aladdin is just nothing. It's, I mean, it's, it's really, it's just like, here's uh, some costumes or safe costumes and how are we going to shoot it? Oh, well, we got coverage and then it's a shot, reverse shot, just boring. This had style and yeah. energy. There was a lot of sweeping camera movements. It was very Martin Scorsese and just like uh, 80s, 90s Martin Scorsese, a lot of camera movements, um, a lot of handheld. Like there's a scene where Cruella... Uh, has this it's a long it's a single take of her getting off this bike and just talking to her mother her deceased mother via this fountain and it's all done in handheld and it's not framed perfectly and I was like holy shit this is a real movie and it's not like rapid fire editing either they let scenes play out maybe sometimes a little too long we'll get to some negatives I'm sure in a bit Um, Mm -hmm. but you know what I mean by like the rapid fire editing where like Mulan especially the first five minutes is just like just right. so much crap was happening. And you're like, you remember movie scenes where they would have a beginning and a middle and end, you know, people I, would be in a room and the direction was great. Craig Gillespie, uh, Gillespie, Craig uh, Gillespie, Gillespie. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Greg. I, great direction. Um, I liked his work before, but this really stands out. And I don't know who, what he did. Did he sell his soul? but it actually feels like Disney let him direct this. It yeah. does not feel like a like made by committee. It feels like an actual directorial vision. Did you right. get a sense of that as well? Absolutely. I just just to jump back quickly that the scene where Cruella has that kind of monologue at the fountain talking to her not actual mother she knows at this point but yeah. where she's just saying, you know, I tried to be good but I'm not I'm, I'm Estella, but I'm also Cruella. And I think that was all done in one take. It was. <clears throat> and she was fantastic in that scene. Mm-hmm. Another shot I really enjoyed, um, which was very early on when she first gets the job at the 
at the department store or whatever. Mm. And it's that one long take that comes down through the seal through the windows and the ceiling. Mm. And then it goes this that shot. I'm sure I'm sure they sort of magic magically edited it together. I yeah. doubt it was actually one shot, but that seeming one shot goes on for I don't know, a good solid minute anyway. Yeah. Goes through like the entire building to then reveal her. And I was just like, well done movie. Cool yeah. shot. Yeah, no, I I I noticed um I noticed a bit of the digital stitching. Like there was a couple moments where they would like they would the camera would pass behind someone's back mm -hmm. and the back would completely obscure the frame just for a moment, but that's enough to hide an edit. But even then, that's, yeah, it went that's, it went the, the one person was on the phone or something when yeah. it was going around the corner. Yeah. So that's not to diminish it because I mean that still takes an incredible amount of talent and skill and timing to do. Uh, but yeah, that that's just a great example of kind of the visual style that this film had. Um, I had a blast throughout it, um, but that was that I, was kind of the thing for me. It was, it was so much more fun than I was expecting. Oh, for sure. Um, I think to get into some negatives though, because I we, I've, we've been gushing about it, but uh, to start off with some of the negatives, I I think that we can both agree that the movie was a little too long. I would, um, I would go a little further and say, I think it was way too long. <laughs> yeah. I know in your, in your review, you said you could see this being like an, an hour 40 or a hundred minutes. I wouldn't mind two hours or just shy, or just, just a bit shy of two hours. Cause I was, I was really into it, but there were definitely moments where I'm like, you could have cut this. Um, the beginning, actually, I thought they could have trimmed down. Yeah. It's like, I think we, I think we got it. You know what I mean? Like she was a troubled child and she got, did bad at school. We didn't need to see like the scene of them in the principal's office. Like you could have made it more montage-y. Mm -hmm. It was really way too long. And I, I didn't dislike it, but it really was until, it wasn't until Emma Stone came into the picture that I was like, okay, I'm into this. Yeah. Um, so they could have trimmed that. Also the second act where, you know, there was like kind of two montages of, of her kind of upstaging the Baroness that I think they could have combined into one. Right. It was like, they had a montage of her doing it. And then another scene happened about like, can you believe that Cruella did this? She upstaged me. And then there was another montage. I'm like, he could have shortened that. Right. So you, you think you could have been even shorter. Yeah. I mean, I, <clears throat> I don't know what I would cut specifically it was why mm. I'm not an editor, but it just, <laughs> it did, it did feel particularly like you said that that first act with, uh, the little girl playing uh, younger Estella. And I thought the girl was good. I tried to look her up on IMDb, but she wasn't listed. So I don't know who she is, mm. <clears throat> but I thought she was good. But that whole thing, like you said, it's like, I get the point. She's a troubled student. I get it. Mm -hmm. Let's yeah. move on. Yeah, it lingered. Yeah. Um, I, and I would have, I, I'm sure I would have been fine with a two hour movie, but it just, it did feel a little bit self-indulgent to me. Mm -hmm. Um certain even certain scenes would play on like a little bit longer than they needed to like you know you got the point of the scene across we can cut yeah um yeah that was that was probably my biggest issue with it um another problem i had with it was um the cgi dogs mm -hmm. i found for me now i don't know if they used a mixture of real dogs and cgi dogs or if they were all cgi i'm not sure mm -hmm. but there were shots and I, I found it was very specific. The shots when the dogs were just kind of sitting or standing, mm -hmm. they looked really good. So maybe those were real dogs. Mm -hmm. But whenever they, for me, whenever they were running, rolling around, something looked off. Did you did you get a yeah. sense of that? Yeah, I, I I can I agree completely. Um, yeah, I I was I like to think that I I was able to spot it where I'm like that's a real dog, that's a fake dog. But when it was, when it, you could tell it was fake, it was really fake. Like there's yeah. a moment of, of the, I mean, they do this often, but there's three Dalmatians owned by the Baroness and they just, you know, hightail, hightail it chasing people. And they're like bumping into shit and it just seems too rubbery and fake. Yeah. And like, I love dogs. I've had dogs forever. And when they, they do bump into stuff, but it, it's way more awkward than that. And they don't look like weird rubbery cartoons. Right. So yeah, the CGI dogs look kind of fake and there were times when it i don't even know why they did it like there were certain moments where they had uh cruella's dog buddy where it's like that's a real dog and then they just had it like a cgi of it walking in the background i'm like right stop it wasn't even just the the dogs at the end when when uh emma stone and and um thompson are, are by the cliff 
I thought there was some really bad green screen. Did you notice yeah, that? I did. Like, yeah. you really see the halo around Emma Stone's head. That was kind of iffy. I will say though that that climax when when Emma Thompson pushes her off the cliff. Obviously, I knew she wasn't dead because she's narrating the movie, mm-hmm. and you know they're probably going to make a sequel. Uh, but I loved that scene. I was because I was like, okay, so I'm I'm curious how they're going to do, like how she survives. Mm-hmm. And then we get the we get the shot of her. She uses her dress to basically become a parachute. I remember just thinking like, that's ridiculous, but I like it anyway. Cause this movie is already really kind of cartoonish anyway. Yeah. And it's based on an animated film. And I don't know. I kind of love that, that shot of her when it, when it opens up, it looked like um, that shot in the, I think it's the finale of game of Thrones where Daenerys is walking out oh, and yeah. the dragon opens its mm. dra- and it looks like she's got wings. It kind of reminded me of that. Um, I loved that scene. I thought it was I, great. I, know, I, I liked the scene a lot. I, it was weird because it was, it was like a, it was like every other shot. It was like, okay, she's falling. That looks good. Then, uh, that there's a weird like slow motion shot of her and that didn't look good. And then she pulls the parachute and that looked good. But then she was in the water. I'm like, oh, Emma Stone is so not in water right now. Yeah. It looks really fake. So it was like, that kind of took me out. But as far as I, I liked, I like how, it, you know, it's fun. You should pull the parachute after jumping off a cliff. It's silly, but I, I enjoyed it. I, I kind of, I couldn't, I kind of didn't buy Like I didn't feel that they established well enough that the mansion was like, that high on a cliff that you'd have time to like pull a chute and actually slow down but whatever that's yeah. nitpicking yeah because uh yeah pulling a parachute that like you know even just a couple hundred feet from the ground you're still gonna hit it pretty oh, yeah. hard um yeah i some another big thing that that bothered me um that was structurally was that i did find this to be kind of tonally inconsistent um because there was a lot of times where I forgot I was watching a Disney movie. Like yeah. it, I was like this in a way this really could work as it could work on its own as a movie. That's not about Cruella DeVille uh, it, where it's just these two women in the, in the like fighting in, in punk rock seventies London in the fashion industry. And I'm down for it. And then it would just kind of cut to like CGI dog hijinks mm-hmm. where there's a chihuahua with an eye patch and he's a rat. And I'm just like, Oh yeah. So there were a, the Disney ness of it felt like it was clashing with with this more mature film that maybe it was clearly and, wanting to be and maybe that's where disney had their their pushback maybe that's where they yeah. were like well you got to put in some goofy disney <clears throat> because pongo is hilarious right so yeah um yeah and yeah because it's written by six people well okay. technically technically five because it's based on on the novel but but i think you could feel that you know what i mean where it's like it probably had an original screenplay and they're like, you gotta, you gotta bump it up. Cause it gets dark. And I know that they, I was, I was surprised by how dark this movie got at times. Yeah. And I know that like, you know, Disney made pirates and pirates of the Caribbean and, and, and Jack Sparrow was a drunk in that, but there was still surprised by how much drinking there was in this. There was a whole scene of Emma Stone just getting, you know, shit faced and defacing a, a like, store window. Like blackout drunk. Yeah. And I'm just like, okay, I, I didn't, I, like I said, Jack Sparrow drinks, but there was something about like more modern setting of just like some just chugging this, this whiskey. But did you feel the, the kind of tonal inconsistencies yeah. too? Yeah. Cause I, I think for the most part, this movie is actually more of a drama than it is a comedy. I mean, it's, mm. it's got, it's got, like you said, it's got moments of levity, but but sometimes, even even with uh, uh, Horace and uh, Jasper, even with oh. them, they got like a little bit too goofy at times, and it, it mm. felt it felt very obvious to me. It almost yeah. some some of those moments almost felt like they were like pickups, like they had a cut of the movie, and they were like, "We need to make this a little bit more kid friendly. Yeah. We got to mm-hmm. get some jokes in there. Have some have some dogs do something silly." Uh-huh. And yeah, I, I found it kind of frustrating because. Like I'll, I'll watch like three, four scenes in a row and they're getting really heavy and I'm like really into it and loving what Emma Stone's doing. And then like a goofy thing with the dog with the eye patch. And Oh yeah. It's, it just, it was a weird, like back and forth. It's that even, even that moment where, you know, the dog breaks them out of prison and like horse is like, I'm going to kiss you on the mouth after this. And I was like, 
why are you taking a moment to make a joke when you're trying to break out of prison right now? Shouldn't you be running? Yeah. And that, yeah. So I, it didn't, it didn't ruin it for me. And it, it, I, I, I understand that it's a Disney film and it's, it's based on 101 Dalmatians. Um, but yeah, through so most throughout most of it, just that didn't even cross my mind. Even when she was calling herself Cruella and had the black and white hair, it just felt so far removed from 101 Dalmatians. Yeah for me that I didn't even, you know, think of it. I mean, it's pa- it's partially because I don't think I've seen either the original cartoon or the one with Glenn Close in like 20 plus years. Yeah, it's probably not, been that long for me. fresh in my mind. So it, that, like, apparently my wife picked it up, but like the, it was the character of um, Anita Darling. Okay. And she's like, yeah, that's from the original. I'm like, okay, I guess, yeah. <laughs> like I, if you say so. Um, one well, last- there's, there's that moment at the end where she's giving, uh, she's like, mailing people the new dalmatian puppies yeah. and at one point the guy's like oh pongo i was like oh that, okay that's a connection because i remember that pongo is a name but yeah yeah i guess that guy uh played by cave Kavan novak who's yeah. great as nandor the vampire in so what we do good. In the shadows so and good we kept saying throughout guillermo it's all right. um but well the one last nitpick that i had is that i simultaneously liked the soundtrack like all of the songs i really enjoyed but there were times where it was too much. And the, the most where the, the place where it stood out the most to me was like that centerpiece again, where they're trying to steal the necklace back, where it was at one after the other, after the other, after the other, where it was like, stop. Like this, you, you just played like four songs back to back without a single, like not even a moment's pause. And it's like, it's too much. Uh, I don't know if you felt that, but it was it was kind of like this. It was almost like a few too many needle drops. I think they could have toned it down a bit. Yeah, because well, also because I was I was also digging the score. There's not a oh, yeah. lot of score because there's a uh-huh. lot of soundtrack, but I was digging yeah. the score. the The moment where I really noticed it was like right at the very end, where she's going into, like they're they're driving in after her funeral. They're driving uh-huh. in to like take over the the uh, castle, the mansion, whatever, and as they're driving in it's black sabbath and it's the intro i I think it's the wizard it's the intro to the wizard i'm like okay sabbath cool and then it just transitions into sympathy for the devil by the stones like with with it the scene doesn't even cut it's just Mm -hmm. like one kind of fades out the other fades in i mean i think the song sympathy for the devil for that scene was a perfect choice yeah but why 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 not just play that why why play 10 seconds of sabbath and then go into that that was weird yeah yeah i noticed that a couple times we, like you said where they would take like here's a weird snippet and then without even a moment's like pause or separation just into something else and it's yeah. like just pick one song like have one song kind of you know i don't know um didn't it ruin did, it but it it did get a little suicide squad that way for sure yeah um but yeah besides that i i'm just like i i really enjoyed this it was way better than than something like this has any right to be where right. it way better than um the uh, cruella deville origin story movie should have been i i don't know like i said i don't know how the stars aligned where out of all the recent projects this really felt like the one that disney made as far as the live action stuff that felt the most inspired like it right. felt like it felt like how a movie should be in the sense that it felt like they they had an idea first and then decided to make the movie as opposed to like Let's just make a Mulan movie. How, what do, how do we do it? It doesn't matter. We're making it. This right. one really felt like, hey, I have an idea for this. Oh, yeah, let's do it. Um, I really, so I really, I really enjoyed it. I, like I said, the, the problems we brought up, I think, holds it back from being like a truly great film. Um, and, but I definitely recommend it if, if people are kind of on the fence about like paying the 30 bucks. I know that's kind of steep for, for some areas. If it's like, if you can see it in theaters for cheaper, do so. <clears throat> If you can't see it in theaters, um, and that's about the price of a regular, you know, ticket for you or two tickets, because around here it's about fifteen bucks for for movie tickets anyway. Yeah, so like, my, so my wife and I watching it at home, it's not a big deal, um, paying that much. So yeah, if you're with a few people and you think like, oh yeah, you can't go to the theater, I highly recommend this. I think that it's it's a ton of fun um, and probably one of the best live action Disney movies they've done in a while. I think. And I got to say, like, even the opening shot of, like, the sort of the Disney 
real i don't know i don't know what those are called but like the disney fanfare i guess the logo yeah yeah but it's like kind of black and white it's just the word disney and the bright red but it's got Uh the the thunder and the lightning and i remember sitting there going i already can tell i'm gonna wish i had seen this in the theater oh yeah i i do i do i might i might because i mean depending on how long it's gonna be playing i might actually check it out again in in theaters it would probably be really cool um and then also hearing that soundtrack in in proper surround sound would be oh, awesome. Yeah. I think that'd be great. Um, but yeah, that's about it for me. Well, oh, one last thing. Um, uh, we'll shout out to the one one of the cast member that I actually wish had more to do. And oh, sorry, I was going to ask you: Are you are you interested in seeing a sequel for this? If they made it, I mean, I already answered this question when we were talking about Joker. Um, <laughs> I, again, I, I would watch it. I, I feel like. It really is the, the the same argument I have for Joker. It feels like this movie was all about the arc of going from Estella to fully embracing Cruella. I feel like I've seen it. I feel like a sequel would just be more adventures, but I would be open to it because I really did enjoy this movie. Here, here's what I would say though, is that, and it didn't really bother me because if some people are like, how is this the same character? Uh, but I, <laughs> if it ended like this, I, I still don't know how Cruella goes to wanting to murder puppies. Right. You know what I mean? Like, cause she has dogs at it. She like adopted the, the Dalmatians. Mm-hmm. Didn't, she didn't hurt a dog at all in this. It doesn't seem to have any sort of animosity. Like they set up, they seem to set up like her animosity towards Dalmatians cause they killed her mom. But then she just kind of adopted the dogs by the yeah. end of it. So it's like, so that's the one thing where I'm like, what would you do with a sequel? I'm like, well, why does she friggin' hate dogs? Um, <laughs> So that's one thing. Uh, I'd be fine if they just kind of ended it here because, like I said, it's so already, already so far removed from the cartoon for me yeah. that it's like I don't need her to kill dogs. One last person I want to shout out. Uh, another reason why I would want a sequel is because I really like this character more for their style because they didn't get a ton to do. But it's I'm, I'm probably going to mispronounce his name, but John McCree. I think McCray. it's Mac- I think it's McCray, but I'm not certain. McCray. Um, yeah, he plays Artie, who looks like a very. Uh, david bowie oh, inspired totally. glam rock guy uh fashion store owner i liked him and i was like i'm into this character i'm into his look he doesn't get a lot to do but he does kind of become her part of her posse at the end of it so i'm like yeah more of him more david bowie uh guy so well and, and like you know i thought she was really good with horace and jasper but the interactions between her and him were like they were great together yeah i loved yeah because i loved it because the jasper and horace are more like her her buddies in crime but her and Artie is a character's name they they have this love of, of fashion and yeah. because she was always at, at odds with the baroness Artie was really the only person that she connected with on a fashion level and so that i really i really like their their dynamic so yeah totally cool. all right so that's that's the review and i guess that's pretty much the show um mm-hmm. So uh, before we sign off, Chris, do you want to let people know where they can follow you online? Yeah, um, you can follow me on Instagram. My handle is called Art of Light and Shadow. Uh, it's kind of a daily blog of all the films I'm watching. Uh, right now I'm doing a, a pretty fun thing. It's a, I'm having a best director tournament. That's essentially uh, my followers are, are, it's user submitted and it's user voting. And I'm getting a, like a bigger response than I thought. It's a lot of fun. Everybody has really strong opinions on who the best directors are so if you're interested in that check it out art of light and shadow on instagram and if you guys want to check out andres's stuff even though he's not here this week jump on youtube do a search for uh cheap thrills unspeakable terror he reviews movies basically sci-fi and horror stuff from the donna cinema to the modern era i believe that's how he words it um his, his reviews are good. They're, they're short. They're to the point. They're a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, so check him out there. Of course, you're already on my YouTube channel, so you know where that is. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Courtshake. Uh, again, we want to thank you guys for watching. We hope you'll consider uh, subscribing to the channel, hitting like, maybe giving the video a share because it really does help the channel grow. We appreciate that very much. Again, we want to remind you that if you ever want to just listen to this podcast without having to watch it, uh, check out Google Podcasts, check out Spotify. Hopefully it's going to be coming soon to places like Stitcher and Apple Podcasts. So check back for that. And uh, I don't know what we're going to be talking about next week, but presumably Andres will be back. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys next week. Take care, everyone. Bye, everybody. Later. 